So uh, welcome everyone who is uh, joining us uh, from all around the world um, to this uh, webinar. Uh, this is the last activity of PRIO's negotiation negotiating disarmament project, um, but the baton will be picked up by uh, PRIO's new disarm project, um, which is run by my colleague Yulia, who you'll be hearing from soon. Um, so next slide, please. So um, yeah, uh, as far as the program goes, um, Yulia and I shall first provide a brief summary of the findings uh, of our research. Um, and you can find links uh, to uh, to the report. We'll post that into the chat um, and you can also see it on the, the web page for this event. Um, we'll then be joined by Miriam Coronel Ferrier, uh, who's in the Philippines, um, and uh, Robert Muga, uh, who's on the other side of the world in Brazil. Um, so I, I thank both of them um, for turning up at uh, fairly um, antisocial hours for both of them. Um, and they'll be introduced pro properly later on by Yulia. Um, we aim to have time for some discussion later, um, but please uh, feel free to use the chat function um, in Teams uh, to write questions, make comments uh, throughout the discussions, and we'll try and monitor those um, uh, as well. Um, so next slide, please. So uh, it's a common assumption uh, that disarmament is a necessary condition for peace, um, that the swords have to be turned into plowshares um, before war can be thought of uh, having ended. And you find that assumption in academic writing uh, about peace processes um, and also in popular ideas about how peace is built uh, after the end of wars. Um, but what we found and what we'll show briefly is uh, that the situation is much more complicated uh, than that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we looked at five different cases, um, uh, which uh, you can see a brief summary here, uh, located in Africa, Asia, Latin America. Uh, but the themes uh, that uh, we'll mention are reflected in other peace processes uh, as well uh, and Rob and Miriam may well go into those issues uh, in a wider context too when they're talking. Um, so next slide please. So we have four intriguing findings um, which I'll present and then Julia will go on to look into in more detail. Um, and Firstly, uh, that comprehensive disarmament wasn't a necessary condition for peace. Um, governments didn't appear to be very concerned if an opposition group kept some of its weapons. Um, and they didn't place a high priority on preventing an opposition group from obtaining more arms during the peace process. Um, so that goes very much against the, the idea I mentioned earlier about sort of popular conception of the role of disarmament. Um, and then secondly, some of the most contentious and difficult ne negotiations concerned the symbolism of disarmament. Uh, things like what language was used to describe it, um, what actually happened to the weapons. Um, uh, and for both the government and the opposition group, uh, there was a desire to avoid symbolism of defeat. Um, uh, and so that symbolic aspect um, took up oftentimes as much time in the negotiations as more technical aspects um, like how the uh, agreement was to be verified. Um, and the next one that was uh, intriguing, um, the offers of external support by donor states or organizations uh, were not always accepted or wanted. Um, Disarmament is a sensitive issue. Uh, an external party needed to be trusted uh, before it could uh, assist in tasks um, like verify, verifying that uh, weapons had been handed in correctly. Uh, and so uh, in, in one case we looked at, there was qu quite a, a sense of pride um, that it had been a, a largely sort of homegrown disarmament effort and hadn't involved uh, a major uh, support from the UN, for example. And the last point, um, 
is that uh, women uh, women's organizations uh, were often excluded uh, from talks on disarmament um, uh, and this you know didn't happen by accident um, uh, the role of militaries um, military forces are uh, you know everywhere highly masculinized um, and what we saw was that one role for external mediators facilitators other external actors could be to promote greater inclusion uh, into the peace processes. So with that, um, Tester, I'll hand over to Yulia, who will go into these issues in some more detail. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nick, and thank you everyone for being here, especially for Miriam and Robert. And I also want to thank uh, Teuta from the communications department who has assisted us in this um, virtual seminar, as well as David, who is a research assistant and going to help us with the questions. So I received the wonderful task of uh, providing a little bit of an explanation for these findings, and uh, I will go through these now. So the first finding that Nick mentioned was was that uh, it is kind of curious that although uh, what we think about disarmament rebels uh, can very often keep some or a lot of their weapons and that disarmament stays as a man's business. Now, what is the, what are the reasons for this? What we found is that the nature of talks very much so influences this outcome. This means that uh, peace negotiations still remain mostly male-dominated so-called elite bargains, which means that a large number of constituencies are excluded from talks. Uh, this means that negotiations often include, exclude other armed groups. This was the case in Colombia, the Philippines and South Sudan, who may be involved in fighting. And uh, also people affected by the use of weapons, especially women uh, or civil society organizations are also excluded. Uh, and the rebel group who is party to the talk can demand concessions and does usually demand concessions from the government in exchange for disarmament. And an outcome of those, those talks may be that a group is allowed to keep some of these arms as long as it uses against other groups and not the government. And you can see this in a little bit of a visual representation. The second curious finding uh, for us was that the extremely large role of symbols in these negotiations and symbolism entails a lot of different issues such as language, the eventual fate of weapons or what to do with the destructed weapons. For example, in Colombia, uh, collected weapons were turned into three monuments. Uh, and what we found uh, across examining these five cases is that disarmament does not need to be comprehensive for actors to agree to it and also for locals to see the effect of it. Uh, the main interest of non-state actors, as we found it in these five cases, was not to appear as defeated or to avoid appearing as them being surrounding uh, their weapons. And for this reason, they came up with a lot of different alternative formulations for disarmament. So in Colombia, the FARC used the laying down of arms formulation, whereas in the Philippines, the MILF was, uh, and the peace process was referring to normalization and decommissioning, and decommissioning was also adopted from the Northern Ireland peace process. So there is kind of a spillover effect here in the terms. And in Nepal, they used the management of arms and armies. However, this symbolic relevance of language is not only pertinent to rebel groups, but we also found that in some cases, states and governments were also very much concerned uh, with avoid appearing as a so-called failed state or a weak state, and uh, thus very often avoided external or played down the role of external parties. Uh, what we also found across these cases is that external actors, in order to be really meaningfully supporting these negotiations, they often have to take a step back and avoid the so-called template thinking in which they use their own technical language and the technical ways of disarmament, which might very often undermine the local cultural understanding and contextual relevance of disarmament. And the third uh, curious finding that uh, I'm going to touch upon a little bit is the very complex role of external actors. So external actors such as the UN, which is a very prominent uh, actor in disarmament matters, uh, can provide a lot of positive uh, influences to such negotiations. Uh, 
The most important positive role played by such actors is funding the deployment of mediation teams and expertise. Uh, external parties can also uh, be committed to assist the implementation of disarmament in terms of providing monitoring and verification teams. Uh, and they can also bring attention to peace processes and force parties to uh, or encourage parties to make talks more inclusive. But because the provision of external support is a leverage as this as this can be withdrawn, it comes with sometimes with negative externalities. For example, in case of Sri Lanka, uh, it was a um, main issue that the LTT was designed was designated as a terrorist organization and sanctions might also sometimes uh, essentially bring parties further away from negotiations and a very interesting example in the role of external parties for us was the South Sudan case where the SPLMA and the government of South Sudan wanted to use some of the funds that would be allocated for disarmament uh, and the external parties used this leverage to direct the disarmament uh, aspect of the negotiations negotiations. But in doing so, they failed to recognize that the parties did not have a real buy-in into the process and never really considered uh, full disarmament. And later on, the UN specifically was criticized for pushing the parties uh, to include standard language in the agreement. So what we found uh, after this extensive uh, research of these five cases that we reassure certain recommendations for policy and uh, practitioner uh, community. The first one would be uh, to keep in mind that disarmament, while often presented by governments as a precondition for entering into talks, is not a precondition but an outcome of such a process. Uh, the second one would be uh, something that we touched upon, the symbolic aspects, is that it is important that weapons aren't used or displayed, and sometimes it is even more important whether they have or whether they have fully been surrendered. One particular aspect where external actors can and should play a large role is to ensure inclusivity uh, and pay attention to include populations that are usually excluded from peace processes. And we also found that uh, it is particularly important to understand the symbols associated with weapons, both before the conflict, during the conflict, and thus what kind of connotations disarmament has. And thus to um, avoid uh, that parties uh, view themselves as being uh, defeated. So this was a very interesting project for us where we uh, gathered a lot of interesting data and information, but we also recognize that there are a lot of unexplored issues in this topic. And the next steps for us would be a three and a half year long project, uh, the Norwegian Research Council funded disarm project, which amongst others will uh, develop a global data set on disarmament and also uh, examine globally the relationship between disarmament and conflict recurrence as well as in a few selected cases. So thank you very much for this. This was our presentation uh, and I'm going to introduce our two fantastic speakers uh, and I'm very honored that both of them could make the time for us. So Miriam Corona Ferrer is a political science professor at the University of the Philippines and she is the first female chief negotiator in the world to sign a final peace agreement with a rebel group. She teaches political science at the university and worked at the UN's Mediation Support Unit. She has more than three decades of practitioner experience in conflict resolution, human rights and the promotion of women's rights. And we are honored to have Miriam on the Disarm Project too. Uh, Dr. Robert Mugat, thank you very much for making time for us. Uh, he specializes in international and public security, smart cities, cyber security and the digital economy. He's an expert on disarmament and demobilization and reintegration. He is also co-founder and principal of the SECDEV group and co-founder of the Igarape Institute. If you haven't checked them, these institutions out, you should. Robert was the research director of the Small Arms Survey from 2008 to 2010 and before that a senior researcher. And he has authored endless and countless books uh, and uh, journal articles on security related topics. So thank you very much again for both of you. And now I'm going to hand it over to Miriam for a uh, 10 to 12 minute uh, little discussion on her experiences, followed by Robert, and then we can open open up the discussion for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Julia and Nick. And of course, I'm 
very pleased and honored to be here with you, with Robert. I've read many of your works. I know you've also done uh, some work on, on the Philippines, so you may be very familiar with what I'm going to say. And of course, Julia has done uh, some research as well. But yeah, let me just first start with um, uh, perhaps uh, some kind of an, a basic observation that uh, when it comes to uh, territorial conflicts, uh, when we talk about disarmament and even demobilization, um, uh, it's, it really has this very state-centered uh, or perhaps you may say state-biased nature, uh, precisely because uh, who is going to disarm and who is going to demobilize, and that is none other, of course, than the, the party that is the non-state party. Uh, which now uh, uh, it has been has opened up to the possibility of becoming a non non state actor and possibly a state actor. But the fact is, it's they who will lose their weapons and they who will have to uh, renounce. I'm not well, maybe renounce is not the right word, but have have to you know change their identity, an identity that had formed most parts of their lives. So in negotiating this armament, it was it's really really very important to have that kind to take it you know take it from where they are. Um, even if your government, if you are not able to understand this uh, this dimension, how it is primarily basically skewed against the armed group, then you really won't be approaching the problem um, problem. Um, in the right way uh, to eventually lead to some kind of a very good uh, peace agreement. And that's why you will find that, for example, in our uh, in our case, um, what we did see was that the more Islamic Liberation Front was dribbling the ball on the matter of uh, uh, the disarmament, what what we call disarmament, but basically on what to do with the weapons and um, and uh, basically a lot of the security issues involved. Um, and that's why of all the different annexes, and all the annexes had a lot of difficulties and controversies, but it was the last annex that we signed, precisely because for them, they wanted to know what they were giving up their arms for. And the power sharing uh, annex, annex and the wealth sharing annex that formed part of the agreement was what was they were giving their arms up for what they were getting in in, in that sense, um, and uh, you see this also in the text, in how the text has been formulated in in a way that it's sort of tucked in, um, tucked in at least in the case of our agreement within a broader framework, a broader framework of uh, as you mentioned what we have called normalization, and that includes a host of other issues, which includes transitional justice. Um, uh, social and economic development, and other the three aspects that they were leveraging vis-a-vis -vis, uh, leveraging the state vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the issue of um, what to do with the, their weapons and combatants, and that has to do with the policing arrangement. They wanted to have more say in the policing arrangement in the autonomous region, as well as what they have framed as redeployment of the armed forces of the Philippines. Of course, a matter that clearly belonged to the to the um, competency of the uh, chief uh, executive, the president of the Philippines. So that was the dance that we had to do, trying to uh, balance uh, these three components where they wish the, you know, to also guarantee some uh, say in the security, in the, in the security arrangement that will be formed, but at the same time also um, uh, see this as, as a comprehensive program and not just really focused on uh, the disarmament uh, side. So the text, uh, if you look at the text, you will find that while demobilization of combatants is more straightforward in how it's formulated, uh, the matter of uh, uh, putting beyond use the weapons and uh, the weapons is really tucked in already in the formulation relating to the to the technicalities and the technicality of having the mandate, for instance, of the independent decommissioning body that will oversee, oversee the process. So I think this actually also leads me to my uh, second point, and that is um, perhaps you, uh, 
uh, the, the the more de between demobilization and disarmament, I would really think disarmament is the more difficult question. I think you had the point in your in your um, report that's uh, where you said that um, it often happens that uh, combatants overstate overstate the number of combatants, but you didn't say anything about what how they you know I don't know if you found anything about. Uh, how they're actually reporting on their weapons, because as far as our experience is concerned, yes, they have, uh, they see, they, there's a kind of a tendency to conflate the combatants because it's attached to the benefits that will come out of the whole package. Um, and at the same time, uh, a tendency to under-report or to, uh, to de-emphasize the number of, of weapons. Um, so in fact, you what you what the figures that they are working on now is, is quite um, is quite uh, skewed. Uh, perhaps you may say a one to five ratio between weapons and combatants. And of course, they have several explanations for this and several reasons as well. One is that of course in uh, in this kind of warfare, guerrilla warfare, uh, you, we know the saying that most of the combatants are actually farmers by day and guerrillas by night. And it's true, in fact, that most of them uh, own their weapons. And that's why uh, now in the process of really uh, putting into place uh, the, 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 the phases of the decommissioning and still being implemented, um, the MILF is uh, sort of uh, standing its ground that what it will decommission are the weapons owned by the organization and not the personal weapons that are owned by by the uh, by their their members, um, and then there is also so in that sense there. I mean, we have to understand this again, of course, not only because of the symbol symbolic value of weapons to them. It has been part of their identity as revolutionaries, and that's why even talking about it openly, publicly, with by the MILF leadership, they had to do it cautiously because there was that kind of. Uh, fear among them that they might sort of um, uh, unduly agitate their own members be precisely because of the symb symbolic value to their identity as revolutionaries. But of course, there are also the security value to these weapons, and that has to do with the fact that just like in most other conflicts, like uh, you mentioned, particularly in South Sudan, there are also other armed groups, and of course in Colombia as well, um, other armed groups that are, um, I mean, uh, that are that reside in the same communities, in the same mountains and marshlands where where the MILF are are also found. And that's why pr pragmatic approach had to be taken. I think that's the whole thrust of your findings and that kind of pragmatism is necessary. One, uh, in our case, uh, our defense defense department was particularly concerned about the cruiser weapons and uh, was more lenient about the uh, small arms and light weapons in that sense, uh, because they uh, in, in it basically because uh, you have a legal framework for that uh, to be able to address that eventually in the future. Um, but in case of cruiser weapons, which are basically weapons of armies, weapons of weapons for uh, real, you know, some kind of almost semi-conventional warfare, uh, then that's something that the government was particularly uh, focused on. And that's why we sort of, in the negotiation, we emphasize the distinction between cruiser weapons and, uh, and uh, other weapons uh, in, and putting emphasis on really securing um, that kind of a process where you decommission the bigger uh, uh, cruiser weapons uh, significantly. Um, and, um, and yeah, so I guess um, when you mentioned about the symbolic and technical aspects of disarmament, certainly there are a lot of these, although in fact, um, perhaps underlying the symbolic components and the technical components are a slew of political, cultural and socioeconomic considerations. Um, but in any case, for instance, in the constructing the independent decommissioning body, it was very important for the MILF uh, that it be led by an Islam, by an Islam a Muslim, uh, precisely uh, on the grounds, uh, according to them, as they have actually uh, articulated it, uh, a, a Muslim uh, person will be able to talk to their troops in terms of Islam, 
why they should give up their arms, why uh, why this is something that will be better for uh, for uh, their own communities, as uh, uh, as um, you know, to talk to them in that sense as brothers in Islam, um, and uh, and that's why. In that sense, it served a symbolic thing. In on our part, of course, we wanted the technical, the technical competencies to accompany the commissioning process, and that's why, in the process of selecting the members uh, to the commission, we had actually nominated Norway and wanted Norway to chair it. But in the end, we gave in to this more important component for them, and that's a symbolic value of having a, a, a Muslim uh, chairing this process. Brunei came in as the third, as the third country uh, who sent in uh, uh, a member to sit in the IDP. And actually, basically, the IDP is not technically independent in the sense that it's also made up of people that are close to government uh, and also close to the MILF and. And I would say that uh, that has certainly uh, political. There are certainly political reasons for that. One is that um, uh, they provide that kind of access, access, and uh, they provide that kind of a forum where, together with the independents, this, this, the third parties, they are able to process such a difficult issue as really tracking down and being able to. Uh, to oversee and to monitor, to verify, to validate um, precisely the weapons um, that will be decommissioned by the MLF and overseen by this uh, by this body. I haven't said much about women in track one, but I think it was also very, very symbolic, symbolic for us to have a woman who chaired the technical working group in behalf of the government that negotiated the annex on normalization, and I can tell you that that actually changed the dynamics. Uh, the fact that um, uh, they had to uh, really work with a woman, something that they are not used to, uh, although that person, uh, uh, Zenaida Brosas, was actually the Deputy Secretary General of our National Security Council, so she was very knowledgeable of uh, the field and she could bring the whole military and police uh, with her precisely because of the nature of her career track and and uh, you know the social and political networks that she had built over her years over the years of her professional life but yeah uh, having them face a woman there look, talking about all of this uh, uh, really sort of followed a different tune followed a different dance had in terms of how it, the, the, all the details were, fine, were eventually put in place to become what is now the annex on normalization of the comprehensive agreement on the Bang Samoro. So perhaps that's about it. Uh, just to say that when we talked about normalization, and again, I would agree with uh, the thrust of your findings, a normalization does not really have to require complete disarmament, uh, although disarmament does have a, not only a symbolic and a technical uh, value, I think in the long run it does have a transformative value in the way people see weapons and arms, but that's going to take a long time, much, much longer than what, what we are monitoring precisely in terms of, you know, the technical and specific aspects of a, of a peace agreement. And in any case, what is normalization in a context where weapons are continue to be loose where there are so many other armed groups. Naturally, uh, what we want is the new normal, but uh, uh, something that is less abnormal is something that we are slowly, slowly building on. And that's the nature of the work. It takes time, it takes patience and persistence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miriam. I think uh, this is such a phenomenal uh, thing that you can be with us and share your personal experiences about this very particular context where there are still ongoing um, conflicts with other rebel groups. And uh, I remember from the research that one of the most tracking aspects that uh, I found out was that there was a time when uh, the Philippine law allowed uh, people to individuals to own up to 15 firearms, uh, which is also something that plays into how this argument will be realized later on. Uh, but enough about this. Thank you very much, uh, Miriam. I'm yeah. sure that a lot of people will have questions. Please write it in the chat and I will hand it over to Robert also to reflect on his own wealth of experiences uh, in this field. Thank you very much, Robert.
Great. Well, well thank you so much um, to you, uh, Julia, Nick, uh, and Prio for, for this invitation to be with you today from Brazil, a country where you're actually entitled to own up to 100 uh, firearms. Um, and what an honor uh, to be here with you, uh, Miriam. Um, you brought that sort of rather rare combination of sharp academic rigor, uh, for which you're known, but also with that really terrific practical mediation experience. So um, really a delight to, to hear your thoughts as somebody on, on the inside. And it's a, it's a treat um, for me to be reflecting on the topic that's quite close to my heart, um, that is to say disarmament, uh, but also on, on a couple of countries where I've spent a large part of my life, um, including Sri Lanka, Colombia, uh, Nepal, the Philippines, and, and Sudan, uh, including South Sudan. Um, great to get this overview also from both of you on the project. Terrific to see DISARM uh, continuing into the next couple of years. We need this kind of research on a topic and, and great to see Prio carrying the torch. Um, maybe just to, to start, I, I think as Nick mentioned in the very beginning, one of the assumptions, I'd even call it one of the orthodoxies of the peace and security world is that disarmament is this sort of necessary condition, even a precondition uh, for peace. And it's an impulse I've seen in virtually every conflict theater around the world, certainly amongst the bilateral, multilateral communities. Um, so uh, over the past couple of decades, we've seen disarmament emerging as a feature, even a key feature of the conflict prevention negotiator and peace builder playbook. Um, and I think research that I've carried out, that others have carried out, that you've carried out um, over the last couple of, couple of decades also show that provisions <clears throat> for disarmament feature in a fair number of, of peace agreements. Um, but I guess the question that you guys are posing is, is whether disarmament really is all that it's cracked up to be. Um, and I think the short answer, as your work shows, if I can reflect a little bit on your, your findings, is that disarmament is complicated. Uh, one of the reasons I think that it is so complicated, and I, I hate to say this, but it, I, I almost feel obliged to, is that there still isn't much of a consensus definition on what disarmament is. I mean, it means many things to many people. If you read the IDDRS or the technical guidance around disarmament that's forwarded by the UN, we talk of, in inverted commas, a controlled collection, documentation, control of disposal of arms, ammunition, explosives, as well as responsible arms management and possibly even legislation. And what we see in practice, and I think Miriam reflects on this and your paper does as well, is that it ranges from voluntary to forced measures. It ranges from techniques to temporarily put weapons beyond use through to permanently destroying uh, weapons. Um, and a host of synonyms emerged in the interim, ranging from micro disarmament and practical arms control to weapons management, weapons collection, decommissioning. So I think that there is a fair bit of, let's call it ambiguity within the field. Uh, and that sometimes can generate some tensions when it comes to the negotiation aspects. Um, more important, I think though, than the competing definitions, uh, is the question of whether it actually works. And I think this is where your paper tries to get to the nub of. That is, does disarmament, you know, does it achieve its twin goals of both reducing the availability of arms, which has to be an intended outcome, it's in the definite, it's in the word, uh, or, or also the perhaps even more important imperative of lowering the risks or even the incidence of armed violence, hostilities, and a return or resumption of conflict. And I think here again, the answer is fairly mixed. Uh, in virtually every case I've studied over the last couple of decades, there's a perception that disarmament, uh, in terms of its short-term goal of reducing weapons availability, was incomplete, it was uneven, it's partial, it's ineffective, creates secondary markets, I mean, all the stuff that Miriam was mentioned. As for whether it reduces the risks of armed violence, the answer, again, is not entirely clear. You know, and I think, as you show, disarmament was not necessarily the key determinant in preventing and reducing post-conflict violence or preventing uh, conflict resurgence. So, with these caveats in mind, I think it's important to understand how it's actually negotiated. And for that, we have to thank you both, uh, Nick and Julia, for taking us into that opaque world uh, of peace negotiations to understand what disarmament is, how it's crafted, um, and the actors and interests that shape outcomes. And I think you're building on the work of others um, who've also pursued this kind of analysis too. And I think it reflects some of their findings as well. Um, and I think your focus, if I understand correctly, are your, your independent variables. Um, to explain disarmament success or failure, if I can put it in binary terms, is the extent to which there's inclusivity in negotiations, um, the role of symbolism in disarmament, uh, and the roles played by external parties. So those are kind of the three areas. At the center of your analysis is this concept of elite bargains 
between leaders of governments and armed groups, almost all of whom, as you point out, are male, uh, with, with some rare exceptions. Um, and these are, de by definition, because they're elite bargains, exclusive, and a result, you know, result invariably in a range of, of um, potentially interested parties or disinterested party, parties or spoilers in the vernacular uh, being left out. Um, another core concept that you raise is this idea of the symbolism of disarmament, which can undermine the actual collection, disposal, or renouncement of arms. And then finally, your third construct around the external parties, in particular, the wariness of foreign interests uh, and inclusion or exclusion of key voices, uh, I think is really important. And your policy conclusions flow from these three, I would call them independent sort of fact variables that you've raised. Um, we need to make elite bargains more inclusive, um, you know, so including not just the users of arms, but also the communities who are affected. Um, this can enhance the uh, viability and legitimacy of the agreement. Your second, I think, big policy conclusion is that to accommodate the symbolic and technical requirements of disarmaments, negotiators should conceive or, or consider alternate framings, um, ensuring a high degree of professionalism throughout and offer alternatives where appropriate. I think these are really important. And your third point around external engagement in terms of a policy conclusion is that you need to be incredibly cautious, often very flexible, with a deep understanding of local interests, as well as a commitment to a longer term presence to monitor, verify, collect, and dispose of arms. And these are all points I think reflected by Miriam as well. This is not a short term process, it's often a long term process, requires a high level of complexity. So I want to just conclude my reflections on offering five what I think are complementary. Uh, or maybe drill down a bit more in five complementary uh, independent variables that I think explain or can help explain disarmament outcomes. And, you know, in any research endeavor, you can't do everything, uh, you know. So I think you focused in on these three that really stood out, and I want to offer a couple of additional ones for, for food for thought. Um, I think the first is that, it, you know, is the context in which disarmament occurs is ultimately fundamental to whether it succeeds or not. Um, the way a conflict ends, whether there's a clear victor or a hurting stalemate, right? The extent of geopolitical or regional dynamics or, in, or involvement in the conflict, the condition or the status of the state of political institutions and the economy, um, culture and social factors that Miriam alluded to, they're all, I think, quite fundamental to determining the predisposition of armed groups and the wider population to disarm. It's so obvious it doesn't almost need to be mentioned, but I think it's really important and often we tend to maybe gloss it over. A related point, I think, and this comes out in your paper, is, is the way a peace process is managed, the role of men in particular, but the extent to which warring parties in civil society are involved, and the clarity, transparency, and equity of the process all matter. It's very dangerous, in fact, probably inappropriate to graft disarmament as a construct into a peace process and treat it as a, as a technical exercise. It's highly political, um, highly political, and I think that's a point that kind of comes through, but I think it's it's clearly also expressed in, in Miriam's uh, reflections as well. A second point, I think, is that disarmament is often the trickiest part of the negotiations, and, and Miriam raises as well. Uh, this is why, not just in the Philippines, but in virtually almost every peace process I've studied, disarmament tends to be relegated to the end of the talks, exactly as was the case in the MILF. Um, it's also why provisions of disarmament, often very short provisions, <laughs> tend to be showing up midway or buried at the end of a peace agreement. And I've actually done some research on hundreds of peace agreements, uh, and this kind of constantly comes up that you see a very short paragraph or two buried somewhere at the back, almost intentionally, uh, I would actually say in some cases very intentionally, um, because of the tricky nature of the negotiation process. And there are a lot of reasons why negotiators tend to push the tricky questions of weapons to the key, end of the queue. Uh, you don't want your peace process, your negotiations to end on day one. Uh, and so there's, you want to build good faith, you want to build transparency, you want to build goodwill. Um, but I think one of the most common reasons we see it at the end is that there are often very acrimonious disputes about disarmament as the precondition for talks. And we see this in Nepal, we saw it in the Philippines, we saw it in El Salvador. Um, these disagreements, and I think this is really key in your report, are linked to the basic security dilemmas facing these parties. No one wants to move forward without transparent and credible security guarantees, uh, least of all armed groups. A third and connected factor, and I think this is one where you really drill down, so it's not really a new one, but I just want to really underline it, is the symbolic implications that emanate from disarmament. Um, giving out, up one's arms, um, whether it's in a conflict zone or an intermediate sort of no war, no peace zone, or in a situation where you've got gangs operating, um, sends out a message 
in some cases, sends a, a perception of weakness um, that can be interpreted, and we saw this in the case of the Philippines, we certainly saw it in the case of Northern Ireland, as surrender by the rank and file. So destroying weapons, uh, you know, likewise, destroying weapons or turning them to statues or musical instruments is also highly symbolic, uh, intended to sort of send a message of resolution or end to hostilities or even a, a redemptive quality to the conflict. Uh, and you know the role of symbolism here is incredibly important, and we see this very much in part, my part of the world in Latin America. Um, symbolism as a strategy and the very strategic deployment of it in the context of disarmament and violence reduction is incredibly important. Um, so we've seen this in, in armed conflicts. We've seen this also in, in, in these so-called in-between settings. And this is especially the case where you tend to see very strong historical, cultural, or social attachments to these weapons as we see in many, many environments, you know, you know, from Northern Ireland to, to Afghanistan. But in a rush to deliver a peace agreement, there's an enormous pressure on negotiators and parties often to deliver. Many of these rather subtle and complex historical, social, cultural issues can be glossed over, not properly thought through, or left intentionally vague and abstract. Now, in some cases, that strategic ambiguity is by design. And we see this in the, in, the, in the use of the expressions like normalization and decommissioning. But in other cases, I would argue, it can also lead to confusion, loss of confidence, and even a rupture. A fourth observation, just in terms of an inter, independent variable that may explain outcomes of discernment, uh, is that processes are often informed by the experience, um, the specific, the literal experience of the negotiators themselves. What is often proposed on the table and notwithstanding the great research and the great incredible wisdom and expertise that mediators bring to the table, especially third party or external mediators, what's offered on the table tends to be what came before in previous conflicts in which that mediator had some experience. Um, it, may, it may be off, maybe come in the form of what the mediators decide to share with the parties of the conflict as examples from which they can draw. It may come from what the parties of the conflict learn in study tours or from Googling, uh, you know, disarmament uh, online and trying to find out what others have done. Um, so what we often see is, is in spite of their, you know, um, intentionally or unintentionally, mediators leaders in, imposing solutions that are less appropriate to the local context. Of course, negotiators are incredibly sensitive to this. You know, they're there to foment, facilitate, not to direct and dictate. But the reality is that these experiences matter. And I, I think we've seen that in shaping the contours of disarmament. And my final point here is that disarmament processes, in terms of their execution, are often incredibly messy. Uh, poorly funded and unevenly implemented. Uh, very few donors, and this is one of the realities of the kind of wider aid environment, are particularly eager uh, to fund uh, disarmament. Um, and only a, a relatively limited number of organizations, and I'm talking here about UN agencies or international NGOs or even local NGOs, are particularly interested in getting involved in the disarmament aspect of it. Well, there's always a support for a flamme de la paix, right? There's always a support for a big burn. Um, the reality is that many processes are inadequate, inadequately prepared for, mapped out, organized, and funded. To the extent that there are some multilaterals that just will not touch this, um, or will have to change the name in order to be able to justify investment. Uh, so despite this, and this is the, uh, one of the paradoxes, I think, and I'm going to close here. Despite the sense that disarmament is seen as instrumental to peace or as a precondition, it's often relatively low down the list of priorities for outsiders uh, and insiders when it comes to supporting peace proceeds. And, and as a result, you can get these somewhat stop-start uh, type activities, which can result in, again, a lack of trust, mistrust, uh, a rupture of you know, security guarantees, and we, we go down the road of the security dilemma again. So for these and other reasons, and I think your paper um, highlights this, a host of alternative approaches to managing arms-related insecurities have emerged in the interim period. Um, we refer to these alternately as arms violence prevention and reduction, uh, community security, interim stability, uh, second generation or first generation DDR, uh, and others. And I think that's a really important point to maybe end on, at least from my side, is that disarmament is, is one of many tools, one of many weapons uh, in the arsenal of, of the uh, negotiator um, during and, and after peace agreements. And I think there's a, a really rich and growing epistemic community out there that's uh, doing some important work on evaluating those outcomes as well. So I'll stop there, hand back to you, and, and looking forward to the Q&A. Rob, thanks very much, um, uh, for, especially for keeping on time. Um, so we've got about 15 minutes um, for 
Q and A. Um, we, uh, I see, we've got lots of questions um, uh, have been written in the chat. Um, also, if somebody uh, would like to uh, ask a question verbally, if there's any time for that, uh, if you could raise your hand uh, using Teams. Um, uh, but first, um, uh, yeah, uh, I'd normally invite Rob and Miriam uh, for another round to respond to each other, but as we've just got 15 minutes or 14 now, I, I think I, I, with your grace, I might skip that. Um, so David, um, who, who's also working on the Disarm project, uh, he's been monitoring the uh, the chat. So I wonder if David, if you could come in and give us um, some of the, the highlights of the questions or points that have been mentioned there. Yeah, thanks Nick and thanks uh, Rob and Miriam and Julia. I think it's been really interesting, a lot of interest from our participants. I think um, there is one important like regular topic here is about the third parties like the United Nations. How are they uh, conceiving the disarmament uh, process and how to affect it in light of these um, findings of the research? Uh, this question is mostly uh, focused to Nick and Julia, but I think it's welcome to Miriam and Rob due to your experience in case you want to answer. And there are other uh, set of questions, especially for Rob and Miriam, is how to build trust from the rebel groups um, in, in laying down the weapons since it's especially like so symbolic for them. It's almost the meaning of their lives at that point. Um, yeah, so, so far I think those are like the main um, bodies of questions, so I would like to ask uh, Miriam or Rob uh, if you have any comment about it before proceeding. Yeah, so um, Miriam, would you like to go ahead? Maybe just unmute yourself, Miriam, because yeah. we, we are also very interested. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading the question and there are quite uh, well different thrusts, uh, but I, I can't really answer for the UN in terms of how it can bring in these studies, but certainly um, uh, there a lot of things are, you, you know, D, uh, DDR is sort of tucked within the discussion of ceasefires. Uh, as far as I know, they, uh, the, 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 con the categories they use is between are, are two, right? Uh, permanent uh, indefinite ceasefires or temporary ceasefires uh, uh, as against permanent ceasefires and permanent ceasefires include uh, these components of DDR and that's how it's being framed uh, because it's supposed to come in the end uh, where in fact and it's very much part of how you end the conflict uh, within the context of a permanent ceasefire. So I, I do know that there's uh, an ongoing review of uh, these guidelines and there's a new one that's coming up. And uh, yeah, I think the inform, uh, but it's again, it's not really focused on disarmament. It's it's focused on its framing is around the concept of a, a ceasefire. So indeed, uh, maybe this is the lesser, lesser, uh, lesser reviewed component precisely as is pointed out by the study. But on the question of trust, um, I think it matters a lot uh, to, uh, uh, to understand the, the kind of work that the armed group has to do in bringing its forces uh, on in line, in line towards that, uh, that uh, commitment to, this, uh, to disarm, basically to disarm, to just use the word disarm and not some of the other euphemisms that have been used. Um, and in that sense, the public that you are talking to, you, you need to talk to this specific public in particular. Of course, you do need to talk to your broader public. As government, your broader public wants to see the armed group disarmed as fast as possible, wants to see that there are enough guarantees to do that. But on the other hand, you, you, uh, you know that to be able to do that, you have to be aware of the sensitivities involved as far as, uh, because it's much better for the armed group to keep its command and control than to lose precisely control over segments of its membership. And then that, that sort of throws away uh, any capability for these uh, groups that eventually um, break away precisely because they, uh, they feel that uh, the terms have been skewed against them. 
So it is that kind of sensitivity that is very necessary. Uh, I think one experience that we had in the initial phases of uh, the commissioning was precisely when there was confusion exactly as to the benefits that will come out of the package. You know, very interestingly, in this case, there is no buyback, uh, buyback program, meaning no money to be exchanged for any guns that's returned, which is somewhat a feature in a good number of uh, this disarmament uh, um, uh, practices. Um, and I, I think we have to credit the MLF that they don't see it in this way, although Again, um, they see they did put a lot of emphasis on benefits that will accrue not only to the individual combatant but also to the whole community. Um, and we also put into in, into the picture uh, all the other the widows and the orphans and, and 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 so on, so that they can also benefit from from the whole process. But again, there is that sensitivity as far as being very clear about the terms for all of this because any. Any uh, misinformation that comes to light precisely creates doubts on the program, creates doubts on the commitment uh, of the government to deliver. It's part of the disarmament bargain uh, in terms of the specific benefits that will come. If these are not really presented and processed and, and also really talking to the ground level com uh, combatants, having people who are actually engaging them, then that kind of uh, uh, trust will easily be diminished by misinformation that's going around. Um, and maybe sometimes uh, inaccurate information also being relayed by their leadership as part of their own, uh, their own um, assuaging uh, techniques uh, to keep their combatants uh, sort of uh, not agitated and even basically satisfied with the whole disarmament process. So a lot of sensitivity there to be able that kind of trust. And number one is to keep your word as, as far as government is concerned. And that's why be clear about what you are committing to to them. Uh, th thanks very much, uh, Miriam. Th those are very good points. Uh, Rob, uh, do you have some brief uh, comments on those issues? Uh? Very brief. Um, I'll start with the, the latter, um, which is about building trust. I, maybe just one observation, which is that when it comes to disarmament, um, and all of its various guises. I think we've tended as a community um, to to focus primarily on sort of the economic uh, aspects of the of the process. We're sort of frame this almost in rational utility maximizing terms. Uh, that is to say, individuals or groups will give up their arms in exchange for some kind of compensation, um, some kind of livelihood assistance, some kind of uh, personal dividend, uh, and we tend to frame it in those terms. And I think. What tends to be under maybe played in the rollout is the intensely political and social dynamics um, that you know accompany a disarmament process, um, and and the importance of building precisely that trust by engineering that into or designing it into the process. Uh, you know the issued amnesties, um, attaching disarmament processes to specific political concessions, uh, the reconciliation process that, that Miriam alluded to. Um, all of these, all of these factors, I think, are are vital um, to uh, you know con the, the conceptualization of the process. So when it comes to practically building trust, I think one is to stagger disarmament. I mean, again, every context will be different, right? But but staggering disarmament over time and attaching it to certain concessions, I think, tends to build trust. Um, offering clear security guarantees that are verifiable uh, and CBMs, confidence building mechanisms, throughout the process, incredibly important. Um, and sometimes un undervalued. Uh, third party verifiers uh, and verification to see that disarmament's happening. I mean, the, the suspicion of mistrust on all sides is often rife. There's always a sense that the second order, third order weapons are being handed in uh, and that the good stuff somewhere are hidden. Um, you know, but having some form of verification system built into it. Um, joint verification. I've seen really ingenious ideas of having both parties having keys to be able to look at the warehouses and be able to maintain, you know, ensure the guns and, and ammunition are still there. Uh, publicizing positive outcomes. I mean, so often, of course, everything is everyone's on tender hooks. There's a lot of risk. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of mistrust. But being able to strategically publicize what's working, I, I think, is incredibly important. And then, of course, and you guys mentioned this in your paper, strategically bringing in the community or wider public into the into the conversation um, and, and leveraging that as an incentive, I think, is important. So we need to kind of balance the economic incentives that are often, you know, 
privileged in these processes and become part of the industry of disarmament with with those other uh, political and social factors. Very briefly on, on the UN, if I understand the correction, the question, I think there are a variety of questions and I can't see the comment uh, function in my telephone here. Uh, but I think that the UN, um, you know, the UN has a whole range of standards and protocols and guidelines and, and strictures uh, around governing disarmament and and a whole series of SOP standard operating procedures have been developed and uh, every peacemaking and peace building and, and conflict prevention and peace agreement process will have access to these protocols. Um, and certainly at the operational level, there's sort of a, a, almost a template uh, that's followed when it comes to rolling these things out. And I'm of course overgeneralizing because these are really smart people in the UN. They understand that local context matters, but often just because of the nature of how the organization functions, <laughs> the vertical nature of the organization, the way bylands tie their aid, they're often forced into operating within a fairly narrow box um, when it comes to rolling out disarmament. Um, even if they understand themselves instinctively or empirically that this is maybe not the best way to go. Uh, and so I think, you know, the IDDRS and, and, and others which offer guidance um, and the SOPs that accompany it are, are very much, I think, shaping the way the UN operationally approaches these issues. Uh, which may be slightly different than the way uh, the UN or, or others as third party brokers may be involved in negotiating them. But the template driven nature I think is fairly strong. What's interesting, I'll end here, is that uh, um, a, a new several new categories have emerged in the UN lexicon uh, and in the international organization nomenclature, uh, attempting in a way to offer a bit more flexibility in how the UN can approach these kinds of processes. And, and one of them is this concept of, of community violence reduction, CBR which is intended to, in a way, be a complement to DDR and disarmament in particular, um, offering flexible funding mechanisms, um, a wider bandwidth of potential entry points for engagement, um, you know, a, a, a longer list of possible alternatives uh, to more formulaic template driven disarmament. So I think that the UN is, is looking to um, because I think the question really was about the UN specifically, looking to create mechanisms to allow more flexibility in some of these um, complicated, especially these no war, no peace situations, uh, whereby um, you know, it, it operate, uh, people on the ground have more latitude and discretion uh, to make choices that are, 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 are aligned with the local contextual realities. So that's the good news, I think. But there is a heavy template-driven approach, approach, which I think is just a, uh, you know, it's a function of the beast. Thanks very much, Rob. Uh, I think we've got time for one one very brief question. Um, uh, so I can see Owen Green uh, at the top of the list there. Um, so if Owen, if you can, if you can make your question or comment very quickly, <laughs> we we could squeeze that in. I think. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks, everybody. Really good report. And I agree with all of the comments. So this is very much within the framework. Um, one comment, one question. I think some of the broader lessons that you've learned here, in a sense, are evergreen. Just a short comment, a reflection. I can remember being in many uh, meetings in UN headquarters in the 1990s when the debate about bringing the extra D into DDNR was hot. And nearly everybody who was experienced, including me, was saying, actually, don't use don't use the word disarmament, use arms management. And even at that point, and, uh, and even at that point, for good reasons and for many of the reasons you've talked about. But in practice, the temptation of having a simple word like disarmament was just unavoidable by UN bureaucracy somehow, not UN experts, but UN bureaucracy, so that we're fighting against that. And I suspect however much we change the IDDRS, and maybe it does need adjustment, those sorts of bigger presumptions will continue. So it's not it's not that issue. My particular point is maybe you should have, uh, it would be interesting, um, I'll read your report later, I haven't done so, to link it a little bit more with the provisions on security sector reform, because clearly um, uh, you'd expect ex non-state actors to want to retain weapons that any other civilians typically have in the in the area. So the question is how much you authorize specific armed groups to retain weapons as an organized entity and in what right, whether or not they're doing it as part of integrating with police forces or armies in some sense on a trajectory of security sector reform, or whether it's a simple unsophisticated reflection of security dilemma. We're going to protect ourselves as a non-integrated entity for some time. And I just, I'd emphasize that. And I wonder how much, you, whether you have any insights from that, from your studies. Um, I, I can try and answer that very quickly. Um, I mean, your final point. Um, 
I mean, first, it, it can be extremely difficult uh, and deliberately difficult to distinguish between the, the uh, I mean, as Miriam was saying, the weapons owned by the group and the weapons owned by its individuals. Uh, and, you know, obviously very easy to take weapons that were owned by the group, give them to the individuals and not much has changed. Um, um, and uh, yeah, uh, uh, and I, I think there's also a third option. I mean, you mentioned having individuals having arms for their own self-defense. Um, uh, having uh, a, a, an armed group which is integrated into the the police or the military as part of a security sector reform. But the third uh, option is a sort of franchised armed group um, in which uh, the the armed group is allowed to carry on operating, is allowed to carry on, um, you know, owning, using weapons, but it now does that, um, you know, in the context of formal loyalty to the state and the government. So, um, yes, yeah, so there's, there's a kind of third option there um, I would say exists but we're we're over time now um, and we, uh, we we would like very much to, to keep on time because we understand everyone is very busy um, so I would like to say thanks again to Rob um, and Miriam um, for for um, your involvement here and you both of you made uh, lots of excellent comments which I've been frantically trying to write down um, uh, and thanks also to um, uh, to, to, uh, for organizing this event uh, and for David for your assistance um, and uh, yeah thank you for everyone who attended um, the, the uh, numbers of people are very uh, very good to see so thank you very much to all of you okay goodbye thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everybody <laughs> cheers